keeping of our gospel lesson, we're reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign they had done, they began, that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. These two miracles pick up the middle of the story that was left out of our gospel lesson last week. Last week we looked at the gospel of Mark and it was the passage immediately before the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on the water and the passage immediately afterwards. And we talked some about what it meant to travel with Jesus and to always be ready for whatever comes next with Jesus. But this passage in the middle of the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on the water was just left out. And it's interestingly, uh, in the folks who put together the lectionary, they decided to pick the stories back up, but they switched gospel accounts on us. Um, they switched from Mark, who gives relatively few details in his telling of the gospel narrative, uh, to John, who gives a lot of details, but different details than everybody else. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that is. So, uh, John, we get John's version this week, uh, and we get some new things to think about. This episode of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water are included in both Mark and John and in Matthew, and the feeding of the 5,000 is included in Luke as well, but Luke leaves off the walking of the water, on the water. So this week we turn our attention to John. Now, maybe it's because it's summertime, but like last week, I am once again drawn to the part of the story that includes water and boats. You can take the boy away from the beach, but you can't get the beach all the way out of the boy, apparently. Um, I grew up on boats, uh, and I just can't get away from them. It doesn't seem. So this time, Jesus has just fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. 5,000 people, the little boy's lunch. And the people are so overcome by the sign that he has performed that they are close to proclaiming him their king. Notice that they think he's performed the sign for them. Really, he had compassion on them because they were in a deserted place and had nothing to eat. But they saw it as, oh, you've performed this sign to prove who you are to us. Jesus 
didn't see it that way and didn't want to be made their king. He doesn't want that kind of power or attention to be their new David. Given the story we read about David this morning, who can blame him? He wouldn't want to be the new David. You want to be something a little better than that story for sure. So Jesus retreats alone to a mount, to the mountain. He goes off by himself to get away from the people and, in this case, his disciples, so as not to be made king. And then we hear that when evening came, the disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and set off to go back to Capernaum, which had become kind of a central point of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. It was the city where they operated out of. It was their home base. They were headed back to their familiar place of ministry and mission and work. Many of their families were probably in Capernaum. Their friends were there. They were going back home. They were going back to the comfortable place that they knew, to Capernaum. But John is really careful in this uh, passage to give us some details about who's not with the disciples. He tells us specifically, they went down, they got into the boat, it was dark, and Jesus had not come to them yet. Jesus had not come to them yet. Jesus is still on the mountain. And meanwhile, the disciples have made a plan regardless of what Jesus was doing. So the disciples choose to set off without Jesus. And they decide that what they need to do is go back to where they are comfortable, to Capernaum, to their home base. And so as they make their own way toward their comfortable goal, they come up against resistance that they cannot overcome on their own. Imagine that disciple of Jesus deciding that they're going to make their own decision regardless of what Jesus is doing, having trouble, then actually accomplishing the goal. It's hard to imagine when we read the Gospels that that could happen, isn't it? It never happens in the Gospels. I think it happens all too often in the Gospels and in life. And the wind comes up, the seas get rough, And it drives them out for about three or four miles out of the way on their journey, having to row the whole time, trying to make their way to Capernaum, the goal that they have set for themselves. Has anybody ever been on the water in a storm, in a boat? It's happened to me a number of times. One time that comes to mind was a scout... And my scout troop had decided to do a fishing trip. We were going to do a fishing tournament, just our scout troop. And we went to North Inlet in Georgetown. And uh, dad, all the dads and people who had boats, everybody had boats, but um, they decided who was going to bring boats. And we took boats down there, and all the scouts divided up, uh, scouts and their dads. And, and so it was me and my dad and, and our boat, and um, my best friend Drew and his dad, uh, were along for the ride with us, and we all headed out into, into North Inlet to fish. We were fishing for spot. And um, as we were fishing, we'd been out for a few hours. We were starting to catch some fish. We were seeing lots of cool stuff in North Inlet. We saw some dolphins swimming by. We were having a good time, and, and all of a sudden from the south, uh, south of Georgetown, we could start to see the black clouds gathering and blowing up from the south towards North Inlet. And as it got closer and closer, it became apparent that that storm was not going to push off the coast. It was coming right at us. And the lightning was popping and the waves and the, the water was starting to get churned up. And 
we knew we had to go. Now, as we'd been out on the water, the tide had started to go out. And so it was becoming lower and lower in the water, and the fastest route back to the boat ramp took us away that we weren't sure we would be able to make it all the way, but we knew we had to try because going the other way would add so much time uh, to our trip that we knew we'd be in the middle of a thunderstorm uh, if we went that way. So we set off on the shortest of the two routes, even though it wasn't the safest, and as we were going, trying to go as fast as we could, we ran onto a sandbar. Meanwhile, the storm has continued to move towards us. Lightning is closer, thunder is louder, the rain is starting to fall, the wind is whipping up. And so then we had two decisions before us. Get the paddle and push backwards, turn around and go the long way again, but we were now 10 minutes removed from the original decision. Or, everybody get out of the boat and float it across the sandbar. Saved us time, so that's the route we went. All four of us got out of the boat, we trimmed the motor up, and we dragged it across the sandbar. Lightning and thunder and rain and wind being on the water in a storm is an uncomfortable place to be. The disciples found themselves on the water in a storm, and no matter how experienced they were, it was an, an uncomfortable place to be. And then Jesus comes walking along on the water. Now the disciples are terrified both of the storm and of the person walking on the water, and we all get that. The storm was one thing, but to see somebody walking on the water, your first thought would probably be a ghost. I, maybe not, but that might be my first thought. And Jesus reassures them with a proclamation about who he is and to not be afraid. Now, the version that I read this morning said that Jesus told them, it is I. And Pastor Rodney and I were talking uh, in the Sunday school hour about the fact that in the Greek and in some other translations of that passage, how it is constructed is actually just I am, which is the same way God tells Moses who God is. I am. So Jesus tells them, I am. Do not be afraid. And so then the disciples want to take Jesus into the boat with them. And I think we all understand that too. If you recognize, hey, this person uh, is, is Jesus and he's got some serious power because he's walking on water. Let's get him in the boat with us instead of out there in the water and then everything will be okay. So they want to get him in the boat, but just as soon as they've said, Jesus, get in the boat with us, the boat reaches the land where they had been heading and struggling and fighting to get to the whole time. Just as soon as they recognize Jesus as I am and abandon their fear and put their trust and hope in him, their boat reaches the land towards which they had been battling for three or four miles in the wrong direction. As we think about this walking on the water passage, I want us to note three things. The first, and this is just really, really fun to me for some reason, Jesus never gets in the boat. In John's account of this passage, Jesus never gets in the boat. We want Jesus to get in the boat with us, right? We want Jesus to get in the boat with us 
Because once Jesus is in the boat with us, then we can be like, all right, Jesus is, is right here next to us. It doesn't matter how we got here in this boat. It doesn't matter that we chose to get in this boat all of our own power without consulting Jesus while we still knew Jesus was on the mountain and not ready to go. It doesn't matter how we got in this boat in the first place. If we get Jesus in the boat with us, then everything will go, be okay. But Jesus doesn't get in the boat with the disciples. He doesn't validate their bad decision by getting in the boat with them. He doesn't subject himself to going wherever their boat was going. And he doesn't just get in the boat because the disciples want him to. Jesus stays walking on the water in this whole passage. Second, the disciples get where they were going only after acknowledging Jesus' importance and identity to their lives. We touched on this a little bit, but the disciples, being terrified, hear Jesus' proclamation, I am. Do not be afraid. And when they recognize Jesus and recognize, you know what, we probably shouldn't have left this guy behind to start with and invite him back into their mess, despite the fact that he doesn't get in the boat with them. Then they reach their destination, the place towards which they were trying to go. And third, the possibilities, think about this, the possibilities of where Jesus intended to go in this passage are virtually endless. Jesus is just walking on the water. Whether he knew the disciples were out there and had decided to go rescue them, if that was his intention, it might have been. We don't know. Did he intend to go to some other city along the Sea of Galilee? We don't know. Jesus is... The wild card in all this. We don't know where he intended to go. Because he had to bail the disciples out. Because they made a decision and then got in trouble. So with these three things that I, I have want us to note, I also have three questions that go along with them for us to consider today and moving forward. The first one, where are you going that you have left Jesus behind? What are the things in your life that you have decided to do that you just decided not to consult Jesus about? You know what? I really don't want to hear what Jesus has to say about this, so I'm going to leave him on the mountain. I'm going to make this decision, and I'm going to set off in the boat by myself. What are the decisions? What are the things in your life? Where are the places that you're going that you have left Jesus behind? and chosen to go your own way. Second, wherever you are and wherever you think you're going, are you ready to acknowledge your need for Jesus when you see him in an unexpected place? In the place you never wanted him to go, in the place you didn't invite him to show up, in the place where you thought, you know what, I can handle this all on my own, Jesus. I'm just going to go, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't need your help. Are you ready to acknowledge Jesus when he comes walking across the water as you are struggling at the oars? Are you ready to recognize him as Lord and Savior in every part of your life. Not just the parts that make you comfortable to give him control over. And last, will you go where Jesus is going, even if it's impossible to know exactly where that is? As Jesus comes walking on the water, the possibilities about where Jesus intends to go are endless. 
Jesus may be going on to the place where you intended to go all along, but Jesus may be going somewhere completely different. Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever Jesus is going? Even if it's impossible to know exactly where that is. Can you trust in his grace and wisdom and love for you enough to go wherever it is that he is going? To give up the idea that you've got it all under control when really you've just been straining at the oars for miles and miles and going nowhere? Are you willing to pause on the shore and maybe ask Jesus, is it time to get in the boat? Are we going somewhere else? Jesus, where do you think we should go? One of the things in this passage that brings me great comfort is that no matter how we get into the boat, no matter how we get into the situation, and no matter where Jesus was going, Jesus finds us walking on the water. All we have to do is have our eyes open and be ready to hear his call to follow where he's going instead of fighting so hard against the wind and the waves that push us around and keep us from getting anywhere. Would you go to God and pray with me this day? Heavenly Almighty God, we desperately want to be in control of our own fate, of our own lives, of every decision we make. We want not to have to consult you. We want to be able to make the decision and execute the plan. To make a way where there's no way to show the world that we can do it all by ourselves. Somehow, no matter how hard we try, we spin our wheels and we get stuck. And we eventually come to a point where we know we need you to bail us out. Help us to start consulting you from the beginning. To ask for your guidance and direction. To follow you where you're going. And to look for you at every point along the way. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, the one who will literally walk on water to bail us out. Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of sending forth this morning is Give to the Winds Thy Fears. It's number 129 in your hymnals. Let's stand and sing together. And as we're singing, I want to invite those who are joining our congregation this morning to uh, come down front to the altar area. <laughs>